My name is Bob Swan, and I'm honored on behalf of the officers and members of our newly established International Peace Center to welcome you to this vitally important virtual discussion tonight. We are honored by the participation of some of the most committed and experienced individuals on planet Earth in working to prevent a nuclear catastrophe. I would especially like to thank our Vice President Hiroko Komiya, who has been indispensable. Uh -oh. in the planning and in tonight the this 1983 played a major role with the media mm -hmm. and with others in the November viewing of 100 million Americans of the day after in that crisis in that tragedy the movie was largely filmed in Lawrence and dedicated to the citizens of Lawrence who appeared or helped produce this history changing film. The images of the day after live on in our minds. The destruction, suffering and dying so dramatically portrayed has now been seen by more than 1 billion people worldwide. The day after awakened our nation and our world to the horrors of nuclear war and our existential mandate as citizens to work for nuclear disarmament. Much in the same way as the, 19, eight, as the 1863 destruction of Lawrence the abolitionist stronghold and free state symbol was the greatest civilian atrocity of the Civil War and helped strengthen the anti-slavery clause cause 160 years ago. This unspeakable early morning destruction of life, businesses, and homes in the thriving new town aroused the North to even greater urgency and moral commitment to winning the Civil War and abolishing slavery. With our poignant history, of War and Peace, the International Peace Center, or IPC, and the citizens of Lawrence once again are involved in a life and death abolitionist crusade. This time, ultimately freeing the world of nuclear weapons. We support mutual nuclear disarmament, strengthening efforts to reduce the current perilous risk of accidental nuclear catastrophe and the adoption by the United States and all nuclear nations and other nations of the signed and enforced 2017 Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. In this new abolitionist spirit, the mayor of Lawrence issued the 75th anniversary proclamation commemorating the August 1945 atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The International Peace Center strongly supports improving our relations with hostile nuclear powers. In this mission of IPC, we remember the words of Lawrence schoolboy Langston Hughes, who became America's most famous African American poet throughout the world. Hughes' famous poem, we have tomorrow bright before us like a flame was known throughout the United States and it's a challenge to all of us who ponder the poem, The Flame. Will the flame be one of enlightenment, cooperation and peace or will the flame be one of a terrible tragedy for our beloved ones? We need to face Langston Hughes's flame we need to face the dangers that we presently are facing with wisdom, compassion, creativity, compromise, and through a middle way to peace that our own president from Kansas, Dwight Eisenhower, championed and uh, delivered in his eight year presidency. It is humbling to serve as co host this evening with Lisa Perry and the outstanding creator of podcasts on numerous symbols related to nuclear weapons and issues. She is the Director of Communications for the William J. Perry Project. It is an honor to be a co-sponsor with the William J. Perry Project of this event. The International Peace Center would like to welcome again all the panelists. It is an honor to serve as co-host with Lisa Perry, the creator and host of her invaluable At the Brink podcast. It is a birthday gift indeed that I will always cherish having the opportunity to work tonight and in the future with such a distinguished and dedicated group of individuals. It is my honor now to introduce Lisa Perry of the William J. Perry Project. Hello, thank you, Bob. Um, just to introduce our webinar for everyone today, um, the format for our webinar, we will start with uh, individual presentations from each of our five panelists. Um, then from there, we will move on to a 25 minute panel discussion between the panelists. Um, and then we will move on to a 15 minute Q&A section. Uh, the Q&A um, 
at any time, if you have any questions in which you would like the individuals of the panelists today to answer some of your questions, you can click on the Q&A section in your Zoom and submit a question and we will try to get to as many as we can at the end of this session. Um, and um, today we will be hearing from some fantastic uh, experts on a number of different areas on the nuclear threat. Um, we will be hearing from uh, Dr. William Perry, uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, also my grandfather, a great privilege, mm -hmm. um, from Tom Kalina, who's the Director of Policy at Plowshares Fund, um, Ira Helfand, um, past president of the International, um, uh, the, and Susan Eisenhower, president of the Eisenhower Group, Setsuko Thurlow, um, who is a I can leader and recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017. Um, to begin, we are hearing from Tom Kalina and Dr. Perry. Uh, Tom Kalina is the director of the Plowsh uh, of policy at Plowshares Fund. He has 30 years of experience in nuclear weapons policy and has been actively involved in many efforts to limit nuclear weapons, including the New START Treaty and the Iran nuclear deal. Along with Dr. Perry, he has co-authored The Button, The New Nuclear Arms Race and Presidential Power from Truman to Trump. Uh, William Perry was the 19th Secretary of Defense under President Clinton. During his time in office, he oversaw the removal of over 8,000 nuclear weapons in the former Soviet Union and the US. Since leaving office, Dr. Perry has dedicated his life to working at lowering the danger of nuclear weapons. In collaboration with George Shultz, Sam Nunn, and Henry Kissinger, he co-wrote five op-eds urging the world to aim for the elimination of nuclear weapons. In 2013, he founded the William J. Perry Project aimed at educating the public about the ongoing nuclear dangers. He also wrote his memoir, My Journey at the Nuclear Brink, and co-authored his new book with Tom Kalina, The Button. Uh, his latest project is the podcast, At the Brink, uh, which he has co-produced with myself uh, about the dangers we still face from nuclear weapons and the stories of those who are fighting to protect us. Um, and we will start uh, with Dr. Perry, I believe you wanted to start speaking. Thank you, Lisa. Well, this is 2021 and this is the year that I will turn 94. And I can tell you from deep personal experience that old age is the pits. It does, however, have one virtue, and that is I have lived through all of the Cold War. Not only lived through it, but participated in all the significant events. And so I have learned lessons from that. I'm gonna share some of those lessons today. One of the early events on that too, and the one that was quite consequential in my thinking on nuclear weapons was the, was the cruise missile crisis, the Cuban Missile Crisis, with 19, way back in 1963. So I was working at the time for our Defense Electronics Laboratory, I was the director of a laboratory, but I was at, I was considered to be somewhat of an expert on Soviet missiles. And so I was asked to come back and head a small intelligence analysis group that would spend every day all day, looking at the intelligence and the photos that were collected over Cuba. And by midnight, we had prepared a report describing the status of that and our estimate of how soon those missiles would become operational. That report was the first thing that President Kennedy read the next morning, and it guided him on the diplomacy he was conducted. In particular, told him how much time he had left to conduct diplomacy, because he was determined to go to military action once those missiles became operational. So this is a very crucial thing, knowing how much time he had to It turned out he had enough time, thankfully. After the event, Cuban Missile Crisis was completed, Kennedy said that he believed that the chance of the Cuban Missile Crisis erupting into a nuclear catastrophe was about one chance in three one in three for what would have essentially been the end of our civilization. But as, gruesome, as horrifying as that estimate was, I think it was low because when Kennedy made that estimate, he did not know 
that the Soviets, beside having the medium range missiles in Cuba not yet operational, also had some short range tactical nuclear missiles in Cuba, which were operational, were equipped with nuclear warheads, and the commander of those units had the authority to use them on his own decision. So if, we, if Kennedy had accepted the unanimous advice of his military advisors to conduct a military operation against Cuba, our troops would have been decimated on the beachhead by those tactical nuclear weapons and a general nuclear war would surely have followed. The lesson I learned from that experience was a nuclear catastrophe could have occurred by a political miscalculation, a simple political calculation, and it almost did. The second experience I wanna share with you occurred in when I was the Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. This was in 1978, and I received a phone call in the middle of the night, about 3 a.m. And I safely picked up the phone. The voice on the other end of the line identified himself as the watch officer to North American Air Defense Command. And the first thing the general said to me was that his computers were showing 200 ICBMs on the way from the Soviet Union to the United States. I will never, ever forget that phone call. Happily, the general quickly went on to add that he's already concluded that the computer was in error. And he was calling me to see if I could help him figure out what had gone wrong with his computer. But before he called me, and before he knew that this was a false alarm, he had also called the White House. And it was when, <clears throat> and the White House was, there was within minutes of waking up the president, who would then have had a decision to make, in five minutes or so to make it, whether to launch our missiles before they believed Soviet missiles destroyed our missiles in their silos. The lesson I learned from that experience was that nuclear catastrophe could occur by a simple technical error. That particular error was a, is a malfunction of the computer, which we soon found and corrected. But another false alarm, which happened just a year, about a year from that, happened with a human error where the operator coming on duty, put in what he thought was the operating tape in the computer, and instead it was the simulating tape. It was simulating a realistic attack. So we can have human errors and we can have technical errors. And we have had them in the past and we'll have them again in the future. And any one of those could have led to a circumstance where the president would be confronted with this awful decision of whether or not to launch a missiles. If he doesn't launch them, our ICBM will be destroyed in the silos. If he does launch them and it's wrong, he will have accidentally started a nuclear war. All during this period, analysts were studying nuclear war and making reports on them. And they were doing simulation of nuclear exchanges in an attempt to determine what it would take to, as they thought, win a nuclear war. One of the six in my mind was a study they made where in this scenario, the Soviet Union ended up with 80 million immediate deaths and the United States ended up with 60 million immediate deaths. And the analysts concluded that the United States had won. We had won that nuclear war. Uh, even with 60 million deaths and not even beginning to take into account the political and the social and the economic consequences would have occurred and the deaths would have occurred after those immediate deaths. President Reagan and President Gorbachev in the mid eighties considered those analyses, considered that way of thinking of nuclear war and posed a new way of thinking about it. It was summed up by an important and critical phrase. It said, a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. And this has influenced my thinking ever since. A nuclear war cannot be won. What we had to focus on is not how to win a nuclear war, but how to prevent a nuclear war from ever occurring. The principal policy we have for preventing that war is deterrence, deterrence of an attack. 
And there's much to be said for that, but there's also much to be said against it. And one of the things I would point out is that during the Cold War, our deterrence led us and the Soviet Union to together build more than 70,000 nuclear weapons, more than 70,000 nuclear weapons. We have somewhat fewer than that now, only 15,000 nuclear weapons. But what happened was that deterrence was in fact not our policy during the Cold War. Our policy was that we should be dominant. We should have more nuclear weapons than any other country, more nuclear weapons than Russia, the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union, of course, believed they should be dominant and they wanted to have more nuclear weapons than us. And that dynamics led to this runaway nuclear arms race leading to an incredible total of 70,000 nuclear weapons. Often in my class, I'm asked by my students, why were 70,000 nuclear weapons necessary for deterrence? And of course, it was, they were not. We could achieve deterrence with 10,000 or 1,000 or maybe 100. The 70,000 resulted from the dynamics of this concept we had to be superior to every other nuclear power. I'm going to turn this, conclude my remarks and turn it over to Tom Kalina in just a minute, but I want to add with the following, end with the following points. I believe that we would be best for the world if we could phase out our ICBMs and I've so recommended. I do not, however, believe that's a political possibility today. And so in short of that, I've recommended that we not proceed with the present program to build hundreds and hundreds of new ICBMs, the so-called GBSD, the Ground-Based Strategic Deterrence Program, at a cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. So I recommend against that, against that program, even if we are proceeding to extend the life of the Minutemen we have. As I said, I'd prefer to phase them out altogether, but realistically, this, the next best alternative is to extend the life and not build this new, this new system. And secondly, I have recommended that we establish, that our government establish sole purpose as a policy, that is a clear and unequivocal statement that the sole purpose of our nuclear weapons is to deter the use against the United States or its allies. So I reckon we establish sole purpose. And at the same time, I recommend we disestablish sole authority. That is allowing the president by himself with no consultation to decide when and where to launch nuclear weapons. With that background, I'm gonna now pass over to Tom Kalina. Tom. Uh, Bill, thank you so much, and thanks to Lisa for the introductions and to all the organizers um, of this event. It's a, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I wanted to pick up on some of uh, Secretary Perry's themes, particularly on the President of the United States having sole authority to launch U.S. nuclear weapons, um, with most Americans simply are not aware of, um, but it's, uh, it's definitely true, and it's, uh, it's been true for 75 years. Um, and, and, and so President Biden has a huge opportunity today, uh, which is he can change US nuclear policy. And unlike so many other challenges he has with a split Congress, um, President Biden can change US nuclear policy and he doesn't, in general, does not need congressional approval to do it. So, so President Biden has a huge amount of latitude in this area. And understand why President Biden needs to act now uh, we just need to go back to January 6th, when former President Trump led uh, what is now the known as the infamous riot um, on the Capitol, which was a huge affront to, to U.S. democracy. Before that moment on January 6th, few could have imagined that such an event could ever take place. And before that moment, few could have really imagined an unstable president starting a nuclear war. Uh, or, or using just one bomb. Yet on January 8th, just two days after the riot, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi imagined it. She was so concerned that she asked the military to find precautions 
to prevent an unstable President Trump from using his sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. But there are no precautions. And that is why President Biden has to act. So the three top things, the three most important things President Biden can do, uh, as Dr. Perry said, is end sole authority. The president should not have sole authority to launch nuclear weapons, but should share that authority with Congress, either all of Congress or a subset of Congress. The president can make that change. There's also legislation in Congress uh, sponsored by Senator Markey and Congressman Liu that would legislate uh, sharing authority to launch nuclear weapons. The second is to specifically prohibit the first use of nuclear weapons. Um, and I think we would have all rested easier at the end of the Trump administration if we knew uh, the president couldn't launch nuclear weapons unless the United States had already been attacked with nuclear weapons. Again, this is something that President Biden can do uh, directly. And there's also legislation in Congress sponsored by Senator Warren uh, and Congressman Smith to create a no first use policy. And lastly, uh, we should, as, as Secretary Perry said, retire the weapons that would be used first in a crisis. And these are the land-based ballistic missiles, the ICBMs, which are tremendously expensive, hundreds of billions of dollars, uh, unnecessary because we have enough other nuclear weapons for deterrence, primarily on submarines, and are very dangerous because they create this false alarm danger that Dr. Perry talked about. These are the weapons that a president would have to use or lose if a president was told that there was a nuclear strike coming from another country. Uh, and ICBMs would have to be used before that strike arrives. That could be a false alarm, and therefore we could start nuclear war by mistake. We could literally blunder into nuclear catastrophe. Again, the president could make that change. Uh, he could cancel the new ICBM, uh, extend the life of the existing one, uh, and or uh, legislation can do that as well. Again, Senator Markey with Congressman Khanna uh, has a bill to phase out, uh, to cancel the new ICBM program. So there's plenty of opportunities here for President Biden to make the world a safer place. Uh, and he needs to do it now. He's got a two year window, two year window before elections um, may change the dynamics. Uh, but again, a lot of this can be done without uh, congressional approval, which makes it such a, a rare and special opportunity for President Biden. So uh, we would urge strongly President Biden to take these steps uh, to protect us from a future uh, unstable president and future uh, blunders into nuclear war. This is his chance and um, I'll end there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Perry. Thank you, Tom Kalina. From here, we will be moving on um, to a short video before uh, Setsuko Thurlow speaks with us. Uh, she wanted us to watch this fantastic uh, short video, which was created by Ari Bazer, a photographer, filmmaker, author, and producer, um, who actually has a very special connection to this issue as well and works in the nuclear space. Uh, Ari is actually the grandson of uh, the only individual who was on the planes uh, that flew over both uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima um, on those two fateful days. Um, we want to start the video now.
and uh, it seems we were missing the sound on that, but it was just music. So um, uh, Satsuka wanted to give you a sense of some context for what she will be talking about. Um, it is an honor to have Setsuko Thurlow with us today. Um, Setsuko is a Hibakusha, which is a survivor of the atomic <laughs> bomb attacks in Japan. Uh, she has a master's degree in social work from the University of Toronto. And since the infamous Castle Bravo hydrogen bomb test, Setsuko has actively campaigned against nuclear weapons, traveling the world to share her story. She is a founding member of ICANN, the International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons. And in 2017, she accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of their campaign. I had the great pleasure of getting to interview Setsuko uh, for our podcast at the brink. And if you're interested in learning a little bit more of her story after this webinar, you can go to atthebrink.org and listen to episode eight <coughs> to uh, hear her recount her story in that episode. Setsuko, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. When I speak of my Hiroshima experience, often the first thing which comes to my mind is an image of my four-year-old nephew, Eiji, transformed into a charred, blackened, and swollen chunk of flesh, which kept begging in a faint voice for water until his death finally released him from his agony. This little boy's image has come to represent in my mind all the innocent children of the world who could be wiped out from the face of earth at any moment by nuclear weapons. This memory and the image a massive death, the sudden and total disappearance of my beloved city, an unspeakable suffering of humanity has been the driving force for me to continue my struggle for the total abolition of all ultimate evil of nuclear weapon. That fateful day, August 6, 1945, as a 13-year-old grade eight student and a member of the student mobilization program, I was at the army headquarters, one mile from the ground zero. About 30 of us students were assigned to work as decoding assistant of sacred messages. At 8.15, as Major Yanai was giving us a pep talk at the assembly, suddenly I saw in the window a blinding bluish white flash. I remember having the sensation of floating in the air as I regained consciousness in the darkness and silence, I found myself pinned by the collapsed building. I could not move and I knew I faced death. I began hearing my classmates faint cries, mother help me, God help me. Then suddenly I felt hands touching my left shoulder and heard the man saying, don't give up, keep moving, keep pushing. I'm trying to free you. See the light coming from the opening, crawl toward it and get out of here as quickly as possible. As I crawled out, the ruins were on fire. Most of my 30 classmates in that same room were burnt to death alive. A soldier ordered me and two other surviving girls to escape to the nearby hills. Outside, I looked around. Although it was morning, it was as dark as twilight because of the dust and smoke rising in the air. 
I saw streams of ghostly figures slowly shuffling from the center of the city toward the nearby hills. They did not look like human beings. Their hair stood straight up and they were naked and tattered, bleeding, burned, blackened and swollen. Parts of their bodies were missing, flesh and skin hanging from their bones. Some with their eyeballs hanging in their hands and some with their stomachs burst open with intestine hanging out. We students joined the ghostly procession, carefully stepping over the dead and dying. There was a deathly silence broken only by the moans of the injured and their plea for water. The foul stench of burnt flesh filled the air. We managed to escape to the foot of the hill where there was an army training ground about the size of two football fields. It was covered with the dead and injured who were desperately begging, often in faint whispers, water, water, please give me water. But we had no containers to carry water. We went to a nearby stream to wash off the blood and the dirt from our, from our bodies. Then we tore off our blouses, soaked them with the water, and hurried back to hold them to the mouths of the injured, who desperately sucked in the moisture. We did not see any doctors or nurses all day. When darkness fell, we sat on the hill and all night we watched the entire city burn. Numbed by the massive and grotesque scale of death and suffering from the, which we had witnessed. About 8,000, the grade seven and eight students from all the high schools in the city were engaged in the emergency task of clearing fire lane in the center of the city. The bomb detonated 650 meters above them and the majority of them were instantly incinerated, vaporized or carbonized by the heat of 4,000 degrees Celsius. Radiation from the bomb affected people in mysterious and random ways with some dying instantly and others weeks, months, or years later by the delayed effects. Radiation is still killing survivors today, 76 years later. I lost nine of my family and close relatives. My sister and the four-year-old nephew I have referred to already. My sister-in-law, two uncles, two aunts, and two cousins. In addition to my schoolmates and teachers, 140,000 lost their lives that day and within six months following. Each one had a name. Each one 
what's loved by someone. Thus, my beloved city of Hiroshima suddenly became desolation with heaps of ashen rubble, skeletons, and blackened corpses. This hell on earth was caused by a single atomic bomb, which would be crude by today's standards. And today's nuclear weapons are many times more deadly and destructive than the ones that destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Even a limited or regional nuclear exchange would have the potential to lead to the catastrophe, killing billions and possibly even resulting in human annihilation and extinction. Thank you, Satsuko, for sharing that difficult testimony and witnessing for us. Uh, it is such a privilege to hear from you uh, and so important for people to understand what we're really talking about when we're talking about nuclear war. Um, next, we will be hearing from Dr. Ira Helfand. Um, Dr. Helfand is has been an expert on the medical consequences of nuclear war for over 40 years and has written and lectured widely on that topic. Um, he's recently the co-president of the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War, which is a partner member of ICANN. And uh, Dr. Helfen is on ICANN's steering committee. He has also written reports on the risk of nuclear terrorism and accidental nuclear war and co-authored the report, Nuclear Famine, Two Billion at Risk. Dr. Helfen. Dr. Helen, if you can unmute yourself. Thank you, Lisa. Um, it, it is a real honor to be part of this panel tonight, uh, but I want to give special thanks to Setsuko. Um, you know, having lived through the horror of August 6, 1945, Setsuko could have just tried to forget about all of this and move past it. But instead, she has chosen to make herself relive that terrible experience over and over again, to share it with all of us around the world in the hopes that we will not have to live through it ourselves. And for her courage and generosity, we are deeply, deeply indebted. Thank you, Setsuko. Um, as Setsuko said, if there's a war today, it's not going to be like Hiroshima or Nagasaki. Each of those was a single bomb on a city 15 kilotons at Hiroshima, 20 kilotons at Nagasaki. A war between the United States and Russia that involved hundreds, if not thousands of warheads, each of them 10 to 50 times more powerful than the bombs which destroyed Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A study that we published in 2003 showed that if just 300 weapons in the Russian arsenal got through to cities in the United States, something like 75 to 100 million people would die in the first half hour. And the US counterattack on Russia would kill a similar number of people there. And if NATO was drawn into the conflict, the great cities of Europe and Canada would also be destroyed. Altogether, 200, 300 million people dead in an afternoon. In addition, we have to understand this is not the whole story because these bombs would destroy the entire infrastructure on which modern civilization depends on which all of us depend to keep ourselves alive. There'd be no electric grid. There'd be no internet. There'd be no food distribution system. There'd be no way of distributing fuel to heat our homes. There'd be no public health system, no banking system. None of the things that we rely on would remain. And in the months that followed this attack, the vast majority of the people in both countries who were not killed outright would die also from starvation, from epidemic disease from exposure. But even that is not the whole story because we now understand that a war between the United States and Russia 
would put enough soot into the upper atmosphere to block out the sun and drop temperatures across the entire planet an average of 45, excuse me, an average of, of 14 degrees Fahrenheit. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperatures would drop 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit. These are temperatures that we have not seen on this planet since the coldest moment of the last ice age, 18,000 years ago. And we would essentially be creating a new man-made atomic ice age. Under these conditions, all the ecosystems that have evolved in the last 15,000 years would collapse, food production would stop, and the vast majority of the human race would starve to death. As Svetsuko observed, we might become extinct as a species. But we've also learned in the last decade that even a much more limited nuclear war, involving perhaps as few as 100 warheads, a war that could take place between India and Pakistan, would also cause worldwide climate disruption not quite as severe as a war between the US and Russia, but enough to disrupt food production across the entire planet and trigger a global famine that could put up to 2 billion people at risk. An event of this magnitude would be the end of civilization as we know it. Now, as Secretary Perry and Tom Kalina have explained to us, this can happen. It's almost happened on a number of occasions. This is the danger that we face. This is the future that will be if we do not do something. But it is not the future that needs to be. Nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. It's not as though an asteroid is coming at the planet and there's nothing that we can do. These are small machines. They're about the size of the chair I'm sitting in right now. We have built them with our own hands and we know how to take them apart. Our planet, our civilization, our species faces a terrible danger but we can do something about it. We can save the world and we need to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ira. And uh, next, uh, Bob will be presenting Susan Eisenhower. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, I'd like to go out of my way to uh, commend Bob Swan and Lisa Perry for convening uh, this session here this evening. What a uh, remarkable set of pre presentations we've had. And I must say that it is a, an enormous honor for me to be here. Uh, with um, Secretary um, uh, William J. Perry, uh, Bill Perry, to, um, uh, to his, among his friends. Um, Bill, it's just great to see you. And uh, I want to commend uh, everyone watching this webinar uh, to read uh, Bill Perry and Tom Kalina's really magnificent book, The Button. Uh, I found it absolutely extraordinary. And having read it, I fully intend to uh, try and help get the word out. Because one of the problems that has occurred to me, especially in watching the other presentations, um, is how much uh, America and the rest of the world has been allowed to forget this existential threat to our security. Uh, I say this because I worked in the field for myself for many years. I had the extraordinary opportunity uh, to uh, work alongside with uh, um, the Clinton administration um, on uh, cooperative threat reduction programs and other things. I, uh, for the Department of Energy, actually went to um, Russia's uh, top secret nuclear weapons facility in the Ural Mountains uh, to provide a report card for the Secretary of Energy uh, on the progress they were making in securing their nuclear materials. Uh, and so I've had a deep and abiding interest in, in this subject. Uh, let me just say, however, um, that I had an early experience with the Cold War myself, which is of an entirely different nature. 
But in 1959, uh, when uh, Nikita Khrushchev came to the United States for a summit with Dwight Eisenhower and took a never to be forgotten 10 day trip around the United States of America, uh, I think an exasperation on my grandfather's part uh, at the Camp David summit, uh, he decided that he had to uh, find a way to communicate with Nikita Khrushchev uh, that would somehow um, <clears throat> tie the two men together with some kind of future vision. Uh, so he called my mother on the telephone um, and he said, please get the kids cleaned up and over at the farm. I'm bringing Khrushchev in the next half hour, my dear mother. Um, I managed to round, round us up and get us over to the house. And we had an extraordinary uh, hour visit with the Soviet premier. Um, and uh, I never lost um, a sense of that meeting because of the way my parents talked about the importance of it. Uh, later to read, of course, that this was in the middle of the so-called Berlin ultimatum, uh, where the future of Berlin uh, was threatened um, by one of the post-war powers of Soviet Union. Um, and so uh, I had an opportunity in some ways to see what was happening in the Eisenhower administration uh, from a child's point of view. But recently I did write a book called How I Led the Principles Behind Eisenhower's Biggest Decisions. Um, and one of the things I noted in my research, which I thought was uh, most interesting, is that in 1946, um, he wrote uh, between, oh, well, I guess it was 1947, forgive me. He wrote um, his memoirs called Crusade in Europe, and he was reflecting on the horrors of World War II. Um, and he went on to say that uh, he hoped, having seen some very, very dark things during that war, um, that uh, the world would find a way uh, to bring about an end to war. He had a rather idealistic large uh, set of aspirations for that because he didn't believe that small wars would necessarily stay small. And he had seen himself what Nazi Germany was willing to do, what uh, uh, to throw everything they had in the arsenal uh, to achieve victory. And he may have also been referencing the dropping of the atomic bomb because uh, he like some other military leaders had opposed its use. In any way, case, he said, I gained an increased hope that this destruction would drive men in self-preservation to find a way of eliminating war. Maybe it was not, maybe it was wishful thinking to believe that fear now, universal fear might possibly uh, succeed where statesmanship and religion had not yet succeeded. Uh, and so, uh, fear, I'm afraid, uh, sadly, is the way we're going to have to address this issue. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think one of the big problems with this subject is that uh, the consequences of a nuclear war are so unimaginable uh, that our politicians and others simply cannot um, enlarge their minds enough to imagine what this end would be. Uh, in any case, um, I want to close by saying that, uh, and again, to underscore my uh, abiding, abiding appreciation for everything um, Dr. Perry has done, not just in this book with Tom Kalina and his earlier book, uh, which I enjoyed so much, uh, View from the Brink, but also in his continuing work. Uh, Dr. Perry is one of the great elder statesmen of our time and this commitment uh, to bringing about the end of um, uh, nuclear weapons in a politically feasible way uh, is extraordinary. Uh, today, we have reason to be fearful. Um, and let's hope that um, this effort that's underway to remind Americans of how dangerous this is uh, will reap some benefits. Uh, today, um, as a colleague of mine, Wayne Mary, a former diplomat in Mo American diplomat in Moscow pointed out in the Hill last week, not since 1943, um, have, I sh I'm sorry, since 1943, the United States Department of Agriculture has always had someone in the embassy in Moscow, uh, except now. Uh, we have cut back on uh, literally all diplomatic um, offices to the point that there, is virtually, there are virtually no channels for communication. Uh, I'd like to end my comments by underscoring something that uh, my grandfather knew well uh, but I've had uh, uh, the honor uh, to see my 
itself and to conclude in a most dramatic way that nuclear powers have responsibilities. Uh, Khrushchev was not regarded as uh, a friend of our country when he came in 1959, uh, nor did my grandfather worry about seeming weak to engage in dialogue with another country uh, capable uh, of uh, bringing such destruction on our own country. So he uh, ended um, his life uh, worrying about a couple of things. He thought that our objective should be to avoid paranoid uncertainty, which is still a worry for us today, especially with so little uh, contact uh, with the uh, uh, Russian Federation. Uh, and finally, he believed deeply uh, that what was going to be required in the nuclear age was relationship management uh, or the end of civilization. So thank you very much. Uh, I was honored to be part of really an extraordinary, um, extraordinary evening. Thank you so much, Susan. Um, we will be moving on to our panel discussion in just a minute. Um, and just to introduce our panel discussion, um, since the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, people around the world have searched for many ways to prevent this tragedy from ever occurring again. In the 50s and the 60s, there were the ban the bomb marches in the US and the UK, culminating in the test ban treaty. As the Cold War heated up in the 80s, the nuclear freeze movement captured the imagina imagination of many, followed soon by the historic Reykjavik summit between Reagan and Gorbachev. After the end of the Cold War, most people thought that th the threat had ended, but as the new century dawned, it had become increasingly clear that the risk was still very real and in fact was beginning to grow. New countries were seeking nuclear weapons and existing nuclear powers were once again expanding their arsenals. In response, former Cold Warriors like my grandfather wrote about the need to proceed towards nuclear abolition. President Obama stated, America's commitment to seek the peace and security of a world without nuclear weapons. People are now looking for new strategies that can make a real difference. These range from grassroots popular movements, pushing for in more international agreements, lobbying Congress for policy changes, and the novel approach of ICANN, getting a UN treaty making nuclear weapons illegal under international law. Our panel is uniquely qualified to talk about these varied approaches and how we might be able to achieve nuclear abolition. And I wanted to start our panel um, uh, with the 10 recommendations uh, that are in uh, Dr. Perry and Tom Kalina's book, The Button, which I think are very illuminating and then ask some questions there. Uh, in The Button, they have 10 recommendations, which are first, end presidential sole nuclear authority and retire the football. Two, prohibit launch on warning. Three, prohibit first use of nuclear weapons. Four is retire all ICBMs and scale back the nuclear rebuild. Five is save new start and go farther. Six, limit strategic nuclear defenses. Seven, don't wait for treaties. Eight is engage diplomatically with North Korea and Iran. Nine, bring the bomb into the new mass movement. And 10, elect a committed president. And Tom and Dr. Perry, I wanna start with you. If you can give us a sense of, of these 10 recommendations, which do you think is most urgent and most pressing right now? Bill, do you wanna go ahead? Do you want me to start? No, you, you go first, Tom. Well, 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 Lisa, thank you so much for that, uh, for that uh, excellent uh, setup. I, I should just say that, you know, we've actually achieved one and a half of those <laughs> I would say so far, uh, the Biden administration extended the New Star Treaty um, just a few weeks after getting into office, which was a huge, huge move and, and tremendously welcome. And we really uh, appreciate and congratulate the Biden administration for doing that. Um, the half is that we've elected a new president. Um, we don't know how committed he is to these issues. Um, certainly, President Biden has way more potential um, than President Trump did on these issues. So there's a lot of hope, um, but but we don't know how far he's going to go. 
because the things he could do, uh, there, there are quite a number of things that, that are tremendously important. And the top three I mentioned before, but I'll just briefly mention again, uh, President Biden has the opportunity now to end uh, sole authority, to end the ability of, of presidents to launch nuclear weapons on their own unilateral initiative. Um, I, I frankly, um, you know, I'm not that worried about President Biden uh, launching nuclear weapons um, by mistake and, and on, in an untoward way, uh, but future presidents may and past presidents could have. So, so this is the opportunity for Biden to fix this for future presidents to come. Uh, and related to that is, is declaring no first use uh, or another formulation of that is sole purpose, that the sole purpose of nuclear weapons should just be to deter their use by others. Um, and then finally to to phase out the weapons that would be used first and are most likely to be used in an accident, um, and that's the ICBMs. Uh, but let me uh, let me stop there and see if uh, if Bill wants to add anything. I like the analysis that Tom's given of those ten recommendations, but I want to add a different point. None of those are going to have any get any traction until unless the public understands what the danger is. We need a huge public education program. Because when we talk one-on-one -on -one with people, even with small groups, they understand and are horrified, want to do something. But the vast public, including, unfortunately, the vast, most of the members of Congress, do not understand the dangers, do not think about those dangers. And somehow, we had to find a way of getting a mass movement going. That was the one recommendation toward the end of our list. But getting a mass movement going comparable to what we had in the, in the early 1980s, which had a very profound effect. But then people were concerned. People were fearful about a nuclear war. They're just not fearful today. It's not, not on their radar at all. And I wanna pass this question as well to the rest of our panelists. If there's anything that in your perspective would be your most urgent uh, movement towards nuclear abolition or to lower the nuclear dangers as you see it. Ira. If I could say something, I, I, I think Secretary Perry's comment is exactly on target. We're not going to get where we need to go until people understand how dangerous the situation is. And in that regard, the thing that I think it'd be most important for the president to do is to make a clear statement that US nuclear policy will no longer be based on the false notion that nuclear weapons make us safe. It will be based going forward on the notion that nuclear weapons are the greatest threat to our security and that our security requires that we work to eliminate all nuclear weapons around the world, that we need a fundamentally different nuclear policy. And I think in that context, clearly stating that we are going to work actively the elimination of nuclear weapons it'll both be easier to bring about the specific interim recommendations that are outlined in the button. And it will also keep us from a potential Pyrrhic victory where we make some of those, adopt some of those steps, but fail to address the underlying problem and continue to rely on a huge nuclear arsenal, which is going to lead to disaster. You know, as several of us suggested in our remarks, we are not here today because we have had wise policy or sound leadership or infallible technology. We're here because we've been unbelievably lucky and our luck is not going to hold. And we have to understand that and we have to move decisively and quickly before that luck gets out. Lisa, if I may just uh, add on to um, uh, Dr. Helton's uh, uh, comment there. Um, I think the public may be more ready today to think about this if we put it in the context of cybersecurity. Uh, we've just had 45% uh, of our um, energy requirements uh, on the East Coast of the United States um, uh, jeopardized uh, because of a ransomware attack. It's, it's not hard for Americans to understand how much messing around with computers and what this new era, by the way, where there are no rules of the road, um, uh, you know, the dangers that are inherent in that. And, and uh, the cyber piece of this uh, really enables even rogue individuals, not even state actors, uh, to play in the hacking game 
Uh, and so I think that the, um, the risk there of some kind of accident or miscalculation or misunderstanding today around nuclear weapons is even more dangerous than it was during the Cold War. So what I would add to the recommendations is please President Biden, let's have a summit with Vladimir Putin and let's begin to start talking about some of the rules of the road, not only around cyber and other things, but uh, also in making sure that the hotline and uh, these uh, um, contacts uh, are restored for this purpose if for nothing else. And Susan, I, I wanted to ask you directly, um, your grandfather famously warned about the dangers of the military industrial complex. And right now we are uh, in the United States, we are looking down the barrel of what is called a nuclear modernization program. That is part of the program that is where we are rebuilding our ICBMs, the GBSD program. Um, in what ways do you see the connection between the military industrial complex and the problems that some individuals are uh, having trying to dismantle ICBMs and trying to retire them and uh, put them into a safer position versus those who are pushing to rebuild the ICBMs and, and continue to spend billions of dollars for these dangerous weapons? Well, I'd like to uh, make two points here. First of all, I, I did point out that there is nothing weak about engaging um, a world leader on the other side where it comes to global security and national security. So what really worries me in the public discourse today is this business about, and it's, it's psychological and it isn't even mentioned, but everybody's very worried about not looking tough enough. Uh, this is exactly the way all sorts of terrible things happen. Uh, it, I grew up in a household where actually, um, you know, the, the tough were soft. I mean, uh, on occasions, what I mean by soft is that they were approachable. As a matter of fact, I was going to put in my comments that Dwight Eisenhower established the psychology department at West Point as chief of staff of the army because he thought human problems had to be solved in human ways. Okay, that's not softness, that's strength. Okay, that's one thing. Um, the other thing, my favorite part of this wonderful book uh, that uh, Bill and Tom have uh, written uh, is uh, what we could do with $2 trillion. What could we do with $2 trillion? Well, it turns out a heck of a lot, right? And uh, we really have to ask ourselves as a strategist, what, what are we trying to accomplish here? Um, and uh, work back from that. But we're gonna have to mobilize uh, a lot of people uh, if we're going to be asking those fundamental questions and having any political success at it. And Tom, I know you've been uh, working with a lot of members of Congress uh, specifically on this issue. I don't know if you want to um, have any further input on the GBSD debate. In fact, well, in fact you were just mentioned in a, uh, a congressional hearing, they mentioned the recommendations that you made in the button. Um, and you didn't get a chance to rebut those if you want to maybe take a chance to rebut those now. <laughs> well, sure. And, and just for a little background, as we've mentioned, you know, the, the Biden administration is considering uh, a new weapon system that was put forward uh, by the Trump administration before President Trump left office, which is to, at the cost of over $200 billion, rebuild our, grand, our land-based ballistic missiles, our ICBMs. Um, and one, uh, these are tremendously expensive weapons, and we have much better uses for the money, as we were just discussing. I mean, certainly investing in pandemic response, investing in infrastructure, investing in healthcare, investing in fighting climate change, all of these things are more important uh, than a new generation of ICBMs, in particular because we don't need this new generation of weapons, uh, because our deterrence is based on an assured retaliation ability. Uh, that's what deterrence is all about. We have that in our submarines, in spades, uh, and backed up by our bombers. We simply don't need uh, nuclear armed ballistic missiles um, in the ground. And not only are they not necessary, but they're dangerous for the reasons we described. I mean, these are the first use weapons um, that because they're on high alert, uh, because they're so vulnerable, uh, if there was an alert situation, a president would feel tremendous pressure to launch them before the attack arrives. Uh, and if that's a false alarm, possibly caused by cyber attack, uh, as Susan mentioned, we would be starting nuclear war uh, by mistake, which to us is the ultimate nightmare. Um, and why we think, you know, one of the key principles here 
is we need to, we need to give presidents more time to decide these things. Um, deciding the fate of the world, whether to launch nuclear weapons in just minutes, no human uh, being can, can do that in, in, a, in a rational way. And so we simply have to move to a system where presidents have not minutes, but hours and days to make this decision. Uh, we can do that, but it takes presidential leadership. Let me add to what Tom has just said. We have pushed for this idea of getting away from launch on warning. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about bringing Congress into the, the decision loop as the constitution in fact requires. But they come back often as well, that would take too long. You can't make a decision in five minutes or 10 minutes or even an hour. And to me, that's the completely turning this situation on its head. We don't want to make a decision in five minutes or 10 minutes from what we're talking about at the end of our civilization. Let's take a, an hour, a day, and maybe two days to, to think about it. Uh, and the story that we have to make this decision in five minutes is just thinking that derived from the Cold War was not correct even then, but certainly not correct today. And I want to uh, switch gears to direct a question to you, Setsuko, uh, which is about ICANN and the remarkable success of the UN Ban Treaty. Um, as of this year, um, uh, the uh, prohibition treaty on treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, has got not just been um, voted in, but it is now ratified. It is international law. Um, and uh, Setsuku, you had the privilege of accepting the Nobel Peace Prize and had a beautiful speech that you spoke um, at the Peace Prize ceremony. Um, can you talk a little bit about where you see things going from here and, and what you think comes next for that effort? Thank you for giving me the chance to talk, but actually, Ira had been involved from the very beginning. His group, doctor's group, are the central leadership for this uh, success. So actually, I much rather Ira respond to that question. But personally, uh, as one Hibakusha, uh, it's been a great privilege I have experienced. I have uh, worked raising the public consciousness on the danger of nuclear weapon for many years. I have been living in North America and uh, over several decades I have been doing this. And um, as I worked with people, um, they were ups and down and they just didn't want to hear survivors' opinion and experiences. And that's not going to happen. And you know, that uh, Hiroshima Nagasaki was necessary. And that kind of American myth and which so deeply uh, penetrated into the psyche of North American and they just didn't want to. But anyway, uh, so there were pains and uh, um, difficulties, but this recent years, I, I have been witnessing, I have been experiencing this incredible um, joy, which is on July the 7th, uh, 2007 at the UN, that very moment when the people just voted and 122 nations adopted this treaty. That moment, I thought at that moment would never come in my lifetime and it did. And I just cried. And you know what I did? First thing I did was communicating with the souls of over hundreds of thousands of people in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We made it, we made it to this point, the first point. We realized we have a long way to go yet, but we reached and we are going to see the end of this process. You just, I guess you people can appreciate that feeling. And then July 22nd, I mean, June, no, January 22nd this year, that was another moment of in, 
for the Bojoy. Thank you, all of you who have worked with me and let me join you and we work together. We, uh, we achieved it together. Oh, what a wonderful sense. Well, uh, as I have said, um, I'd like to share this moment with Ira. You were involved in this from the very beginning, organizational preparation for this event. Would you like to offer that? I think for us who are not involved in the central planning, I think we have lots of work to do uh, to get more people interested in learning what the, the treaty is all about. And I am delighted in Japan that's been happening. I must give the credit to the journalists in Japan. They have kept the public well informed. And guess what? Not just the academic groups or uh, peace research uh, experts, but the groups which have been publishing the, the weekly journal to the school children, grade school children, junior high kids, and high school kids, all those organizations are coming to me. I'm sure they are going to other people too. I live in Canada, but I get a request from Tokyo asking me to write this and that because kids are fascinated to learn more about it. And women's group, music group, theater group, and fashion group. I had nothing to do with the fashion, but now those groups of human beings are getting together, want to find out for themselves what people are talking about, what the treaty is all about. And I think this kind of uh, the, the development is due to, that, to those happy occasion like July the 7th, January 10th, 22nd. So I think we have to capture this, seize this opportunity to inform the people. And what I'm, I have been trying to do is after they get information, they act. And I keep urging everybody act. What kind of action? Well, you know, there are various processes, but Finally, they have to speak to the politicians, members of parliament, and get the parliament to have the debate among themselves, not like the, in the past. Uh, in the past, the prime minister just all small people in the cabinet made a decision and they run for the final decision making. That should never happen. This is democracy. You have to have the public debate and the debate with the politician and let the politician to study the issue and force the prime minister. Japan has not um, uh, that, um, rati ratified yet, neither my adopted country, Canada. And so we have lots to do. Get the people moving and let them work and let them feel we are sharing these responsibilities together. And at least I can say some of it is happening in Japan, not here in Canada where I live right now. And the United States, yes, well, anyway. So that's action part about the legal side. Uh, Ira, uh, would you like to? Yeah, just one quick observation and, and it, it's more to to the message that Setsuko brought to this whole process. The reason that the treaty and the prohibition of nuclear weapons advanced the way it did was because we were able to change the focus of the conversation and stop talking about nuclear weapons as though it was some kind of a elaborate game of three-dimensional chess and start talking about the humanitarian aspects of nuclear war. And Setsuko's message about what happened to her in Hiroshima was absolutely critical in that process. Some of the data that I presented earlier about what will happen if there's a limited nuclear war, the nuclear famine dimension was very important as well. And it goes back to something that Susan said a while ago, which is that the big problem we have today is that people cannot get their arms around this. Um, they cannot believe 
that a nuclear war could actually take place. Even people like those of us on the panel who know that nuclear war can take place really can't believe it. 40 years ago in the 80s, we did believe it. I don't know what was exactly was different then. People really thought we could have a nuclear war and that's why millions of people did what Setsuko was just urging us all to do now. We somehow or other have to figure out how to recreate that sense of understanding that nuclear war really can happen, that it actually will happen if you don't get rid of these weapons. And I think that is the real challenge before us. And in terms of what the leadership in this country can do, um, the bully pulpit of the president could play an enormous role in moving this whole process forward. We all have to do our work as well, but we could sure use some help uh, from the political leadership, which has generally ignored this issue for the last 30 years and needs to step up to the plate and start talking about it. All right, if I could just follow up here, uh, the reason there's an opportunity now is because we've discovered after a whole year of a pandemic, year plus, stuff happens. Stuff happens. I mean, this came for most Americans. Uh, uh, Bill Perry uh, and I have been involved in the nuclear threat initiative for years and, and the rest of it. So we've been talking about uh, pandemics and things for since the, the founding of that organization. But um, uh, honestly, the public is now um, more ready today than ever before to understand that things can come, the things that seemed unimaginable, um, you know, um, are possibly, maybe we need to do some reimagining. That's right. The, I mean, the experts warned us for the last three decades that there would be a great pandemic. We ignored those warnings and we paid exactly. the price. Yeah. The experts are warning us now we're going to have a nuclear war if we don't get rid of these weapons. We better listen this time. Mm -hmm. let, let me add a few more words to the treaty. Um, I think that process offered us victims of the use of nuclear weapon and victims of testing, more than 2,000 nuclear bomb testing. And there are countless people around the world who have been suffering, who have not been heard. And we all took part in this process. And we felt great that finally we are able to speak out, we were listened to. And I think as a result, I think our voices uh, were taken into consideration. So that gave us a great sense of uh, the fulfillment. And I think it's important. It's about time that the people who suffered from this get some sense of support from the world. And that happened by this success. Thank you. Thank you all. And uh, I will move into our Q&A section. We just have uh, two short questions. We are running over a little bit. Um, and just to wrap up, uh, to start, we have um, sort of a two-part question for Dr. Perry, which is firstly, uh, do you still support getting rid of launch on warning? And in addition, how would no, uh, eliminating sole authority to launch work? The answer to the first question is yes, I still support. Uh, second, how would it work? There could be a variety of ways it would work. The way that I tend to think myself is that a, a senior, the leadership in Congress, maybe four top leaders, would be required to be consulted by the president in conjunction with the Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State. That process, it has been pointed out to me, would take a while. It could not be done in five minutes, it could not be done even an hour probably. And as I also answer to that, I think that's good, not bad. I do not want the decision to end civilization to be made in five minutes or even an hour or even a day. And uh, we will wrap up our Q&A section with I think a very uh, important question that I think a lot of people uh, ask often, which is, how are the ways in which individuals uh, can support this effort, whether they are artists, um, if maybe there's a space for civil disobedience, um, how is it that um, individuals who are inspired by this presentation um, 
be able to support these efforts. And I'll offer that to anyone who is interested in answering. I'll make a quick point, which is the one of the most influential ways of, inf of, of causing people to understand the dangers and want to do something about it was a movie called The Day After, which has already been described in this program. So artists, poets, uh, all have uh, dealing with communications. What we need is to communicate to people how damn serious this problem is and how real it is. And we could use a lot of help. And I think the uh, artists among us have, and the writers among us, the poets among us are perhaps best qualified to do that. Um, if I could add a quick thing, um, we've launched a, gra a national grassroots campaign called Back from the Brink, the call to prevent nuclear war to provide a vehicle for individuals who want to get involved in, in changing uh, US government policy on this issue. I put the uh, web address in the chat. It's, it's easy to remember www.preventnuclearwar.org and anyone who wants to be involved in as, as an individual or who wants to bring the organization into an active campaign uh, for all of the, the initiatives that we've been talking about tonight, I would urge you to visit that website. And uh, if an, anyone else wanted to comment on that, otherwise uh, I will wrap up our uh, panel discussion for today. Can I add a few words? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, um, Dr. Perry, well, in his book, and he just mentioned about so authority over the black box thing. Let me just share the episode with you because exactly five years ago, uh, President uh, Obama visited Hiroshima and he met the survivors, citizens, dignitaries at the center of the Peace Park. There is a cenotaph in the center and that's where a hundred of thousands of uh, dead people's names are uh, kept, maintained. And that's the holy, sacred place. Anyway, the meeting was uh, held right there. But of course, president have to appear accompanied by the little black box. And not everybody understood, but some people did. And the media, Japanese uh, and the international media, they all reported. And of course, the informed people, well, they felt very indignant. Um, they said, well, this is more than insensitivity. This is blasphemy. A lot have felt that, but they suppressed their own feeling, they didn't make any issue about it. After all, they have to be a gracious uh, host, host to the visit, visitor. Anyway, but that did happen. And the people were greatly hoping for a great speech. Uh, president became so world famous with his speech in Prague in 2009. And I, in that speech, we remember what important thing we thought we heard. He said, United States was the, on, the only nation which actually used nuclear weapons, therefore has a special moral responsibility to work. Um, to achieve the world free of nuclear weapon. Um, but um, his uh, evasive language uh, did not bring any uh, concrete uh, proposal, arms control or something which everybody was expecting after he became so famous for the wonderful speeches as he visited many cities. And certainly in Hiroshima, he would make something concrete and something the world was waiting for, 
It didn't happen. He just simply explained atomic bombing, where he started the speech by saying, uh, death fell from sky. That perplexed people. Anyway, um, that was not exactly a fulfilling moment. I just felt I wanted to share with this episode because it does have something to do with what Dr. Perry is talking about. Something has to happen about that. So. Thank you, Setsuko. Um, and I will actually add my own comment to this question, which is to say, uh, Dr. Perry and I created uh, our podcast at the brink, uh, specifically as a way to educate people who are unaware of some of the issues surrounding nuclear weapons and a way to personalize this issue for those who find this issue to be uh, too big to grapple with sometimes. Uh, I definitely recommend all of our uh, listeners today to go check it out anywhere that you find your podcasts. You can also go to atthebrink.org. Um, it actually features four of our five uh, amazing panelists today uh, in various episodes. Um, and it's a great way if you are trying to raise awareness with your family and friends, you can share these episodes with them so that they can better understand what the risks are and why you're trying to uh, activate change in this area. And with that, I just want to thank all of our amazing uh, panelists today for some wonderful conversation. Uh, and I will pass on to Bob to close out our session for the day. Thank you. I wish to thank uh, all the panelists who are here the individuals on our panel, extraordinary group of people, our attendees that uh, were with us, the William J. Perry Project, ICANN, all the organizations that were mentioned. Near the end of the day after, which is mentioned a couple of times tonight, these famous words were spoken that live on in the desperate hopelessness of the search for humanity and for help when they were spoken. This is Lawrence. This is Lawrence, Kansas. Is anybody out there? Anybody at all. This tragic plea, like the poem Langston Hughes to Flame, challenges us to face this increasing nuclear threat head on that's been laid out so well by our brilliant panelists tonight, forcefully, decisively, and now. In this existential mission, we remember Gorbachev and Reagan's profound warning, worth stating once again. A nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. The International Peace Center, the William J. Perry Project, and all the organizations on this panel tonight will join you in this life-saving mission before us. Let us fully support efforts to reduce the nuclear risk and work for a nuclear-free world. But as been mentioned, we must also develop grassroots uh, uh, participation and advocacy if we were to absolutely abolish in the future nuclear weapons. As President Eisenhower declared, people to people will save the world. These words inspired us in Lawrence in the 1980s and thousands of groups and millions of Americans as they participated in helping force our government to enter serious negotiations. We have a lot of work to do, as Satiko said, we can definitely save the world and we must try, as Iris said. We also must never forget that it is the citizens that must start from the bottom up in making these changes. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks to all the panelists and thanks to all of you watching. <laughs>